Welcome to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast from Discovery Park of America in Union City, Tennessee. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends at Leaders Credit Union. Thank you, Zach, and welcome everyone to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast where we explore the history, the people, and the culture of our home here in West Tennessee. I'm your host, Scott Williams. Okay, Zach, before I introduce today's guest, what's something you discovered this week at Discovery Park of America? This week, I actually discovered something from the gift shop. We have a children's book called Uncle Juby's Birds by Dr. Sherry Abdelhadi. It's a heartwarming story about how she discovered Juby Henderson was a great was her great uncle, and hearing stories about him inspired her to become an artist as well. It's a, it's a nice book for folks to add to their kids' collections, and of course, you can you can see Henderson's art in the Southern Artist Showcase here at Discovery Park until Sunday, August 11th. Thank you, Zach. That was really interesting. Um, our guest today is an insider. With everybody out working in their gardens and in their yards and everything, we have a special guest today, John Watkins, who's our director of grounds here at Discovery Park of America and responsible for making it such a beautiful place. He's been here since the very beginning. Um, welcome, John. Thank you. It's a good day to be inside. It's actually uh, warm out today. It's going to be close to 90, so it's nice to be in the air conditioning for a little bit anyways. Oh, my goodness. It is... Um, it is finally summertime. It feels like it has taken forever to get warm enough for things to start really growing well. Back us up a little bit, and before we start talking about you at Discovery Park, tell us where you came from and, okay. and where you grew up, that kind of thing. Well, I'm a native to this area. I actually grew up in, in Martin, Tennessee, and uh, my dad and my granddad grew up in Reeves, Tennessee, so this was kind of uh, old stomping grounds for them and for me, too, so... When I heard about this project going on at the beginning, I was uh, it, it really didn't register with me. I couldn't believe <clears throat> that uh, something like this was going to come to West Tennessee. So uh, it, it was a very exciting uh, proposition, and, and I jumped at the chance and have never looked back. It's just a fascinating place to work, to, to come to work every day. Now, I know, but for the folks listening, <clears throat> what was your professional background? Oh, okay. Well, I, uh, you know, I went to school at UT Martin, graduated from there, and then went on to University of Tennessee and got a master's degree in, in horticulture in uh, landscape design. So uh, I moved around a little bit after that. I actually worked, my first job was in uh, close to Williamsburg, Virginia, working at a historic uh, estate and plantation there which was very exciting it was a long ways from home so which, which one was it it was it was a private residence oh, oh, actually okay. so it wasn't gotcha. one that it was on right on the james river huh. uh it was exciting I, I took my wife right after we got married uh that night we started driving for virginia so wow. it was it was interesting and I, I enjoyed that it was a great way to get my feet wet and really and you actually out. worked there like and i was job? i was yeah we had two huh. to three hundred acres of wow. uh it was fascinating i was I loved the job. The only thing I really didn't like as much about it was that it was a private estate. And I, my interest, background interest, I really loved public horticulture. So from there, uh, we up and moved to uh, Rome, Georgia, which is in northwest Georgia, and uh, at a uh, private, not, well, it was a liberal arts college called Berry College. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that. Fascinating place. Still, uh, I think to this day, is one of the largest campuses in the United States, but also it could be still the largest in the world. Over 46,000 acres of wow. grounds there. So uh, that was a lot to take care of. But now, was, when my daughter and I were looking at colleges for her to go to, and we did a big college tour, I did look at everyone's grass to see, you know, <laughs> and their landscaping, you know, to see what kind of, you know, where do they put, you know, I like nice grass. So. Yes, it was, uh, and, and that's one thing I always told them, you know, a, a very few uh, parents and, and a lot of the students uh We'll, a lot of them will see inside the buildings, but they won't see every building. But everybody that comes on your campus or your property is going to see the outside. So if it's not maintained well, it says a little bit about the college itself and where they put their priorities and, and how they, they keep things up. So it was, Now, uh, what, what um, do you remember about <laughs> your very first visit with – I don't know what the interview – I don't know if you interviewed with Robert Kirkland first or what, what was the process and what, what are your memories of those very, very first moments where you first began to get <clears throat> looped into what was going on here? I had a, 
actually one of my uh, contractors that I was at the time I was working in Murray, Kentucky and, and doing landscape design there and uh, had a contractor come in and, and start mentioning something about this. And I was like, what are you even talking about? And so I'd made a trip over just to kind of drive around at that time. It was still under construction, but I wanted to see the outside of it and see what was going on. And it blew me away from the first day. And uh, now for anybody who wasn't around then, describe <clears throat> kind of what you saw when you came here just to see what things look like. It, it, it uh, oh, that's a tough one. It, it, it was intimidating to start with because the structure the building itself and, and if everybody's seen a picture of it it's an impressive structure but just looking at the scope of the grounds and how much was going to be maintained and the water uh waterways and the lakes and all the fountains and then just looking at the uh once i got to know a, a little bit better but looking at mr kirkland's robert kirkland's interest in plant materials he obviously his estate and his house were highly maintained and he expected even more than that out here so uh, i knew it was going to be a daunting task and but very exciting and it was something that i would really have a passion for and, and really love to do but pictures i've seen when it comes to like trees and stuff it kind of looked look like the surface of the moon i mean there was really it was rough. it was cornfield at first and there was nothing right there was a lot of bare ground and i said how in the world are they ever going to turn this into what his vision was and what the vision for the parks and i looked through a lot of the the landscape drawings and at the time they had a, a contractor out of memphis that was doing all the installation and also somebody had drawn up uh, extensive plans from everything from irrigation to wiring to sidewalks and everything uh so I'd, I'd gone through those and and i was like boy i don't know if they're ever going to get this done it's going to well, so be yeah, an ongoing how was your how was your what was your next point of con how did you get your foot in the door uh, I knew of a uh, an acquaintance that knew that there was going to be a job opening, and he put me in touch with uh, with Jim Rippey, okay. who was uh, instrumental in getting everything started, CEO at that time, and uh, came in and talked with him and kind of shared my background. I'd had you know uh, public horticulture uh, background, and I'd also uh, while I was at Berry College, I taught in the horticulture department for about twelve years, and uh, so the things that were going on here and the vision for discovery park especially with education being very full it felt to me like it was going to be a great fit and i, I think they were kind of hoping the same thing and it just kind of worked its way from there and were you already living in paris at the time at that time i was back in paris uh, i live in paris now and everybody always asks good grief you live in paris and you drive here every day i said yes you know it, there's very few places that i would work and in, enjoy that that much but I still say to this day, when I get within viewing distance, which is about a mile and a half down the road, and see that flag and see the tower and everything, a little smile still comes on my face uh, every day. And uh, some days I have to force that smile, but, but it's all right. good. And it's still, what an exciting place to come to work every day. So, yeah, it's uh, still, for me too, when you see the building, you're like, oh, you, you have a little bit of excitement. Um, so, so you got hired. Did you have a sit down with Robert Kirkland where he laid out his personal vision for what things should look like? Many times. And you want to talk about it a little bit of intimidating is, is to sit down in, in front of him and hear some of his ideas. He just had a different mindset. And uh, some of the things that I would be a little bit concerned about, you know, can we can we actually make this happen? Can we afford to do this and everything? And he said, John, don't you worry about that. And he said, uh, I, this is how I want it to look. And by golly, that's how it was going to look. So, And what, and specifically, <clears throat> can you remember any sort of like of the vision he had? Like what, what did, what was he seeing in his head when he was talking to you? There were a couple of things. I used to be scared to death. I would be out on the grounds doing something and all of a sudden I'd see this big dually pickup truck come tearing across the middle of the great lawn or across the grass or something i'm like who is that oh it's mr kirkland he can do whatever he wants to do and and he would drive out and roll down the window and said you know what i want to see some more trees or see some more shrubs uh probably the thing that stuck out the one comment that he made was uh we were sitting in the office one day and going over some plant materials he said john i want this place to look like augusta national mm -hmm. uh, the masters mm -hmm. and i said uh, I, we will do everything that we can do to do that. I said, if you will give me about a, uh, somewhere between 80 and 100 years, which is about the how long they've been working on the Masters, I can definitely right. do that. But his vision was a little more uh, immediate. And so we, we were pulling from 
places he had visited he traveled all over the world sure. so he had ideas on gardens and he would bring those ideas to me and we would talk them over and uh kind of figure out what would work or what what would work in this area um uh, and and we pretty much made it happen but when he said he wanted five thousand azaleas we put in five thousand azaleas and then so. what about the knockout roses were those the things he wanted that didn't work out very well there were a couple of things we're <clears throat> again we're still we were so new here uh and it was a cornfield there were from looking at some of the really beginning drawings there were no trees out here mm -hmm. obviously it was farmland so everything had to had to uh, start in complete hot sun uh, soils were not the best out here since they had done a lot of moving and scraping and that sort of thing. So yes, we did have some problems with uh, with some of the plants. If you're familiar with plant materials, azaleas need a little bit of shade and they really need uh, well-drained soils and all that, and we just didn't have that here. So we did our best to amend and, and build them up where we could get some of those. And, and we lost a good number of them, but uh, you know, it's trial and error. And we go back with things that are similar to that, that give us the same look, but that are a little more hardy in this area. And he did love the roses, um, knockout roses in particular. And that was another one he said, I want 5,000 roses out here. And, and so we ordered 5,000 roses and scattered them around uh they did great for a while but if uh, anybody out there in the horti horticulture world can tell you knockout roses have a uh, a deadly disease that is a problem called rose rosette and mm -hmm. there is no cure for it and we have since been losing quite a few every year so we're finding things that that we know will do better than that and we plug those back in and still get the same effect it's just not uh, exact same plants and we had the same problem with the uh maize i remember oh me uh, that was partly uh, that I'll, I'll take full credit for that well, it was one. the ground i remember you saying it was like clay it was the hardest ground we were actually we couldn't hand dig anything especially since we were putting in over 400 trees out there uh so we had augers uh, on either a bobcat skid steer or a a tractor hmm. and that ground was so hard that we actually sheared augers off of the tractor uh wow. two or three times to try and get holes in there uh we did our best to go back and amend some of those soils but there were times during august uh when it hadn't rained for two or three weeks or, or a month and we would go out there and pull a dead tree out and there's still water sitting in the bottom of that so it was um, not the best of circumstances but we we live and we learn and uh, we put in raised beds now so we can get them up above and actually have good soil in there and it's it's growing like gangbusters now. So, We're going to take a quick break, and when we get back, um, we're going to talk about the future. With nine branches in West Tennessee and nationwide ATM and branch access, you can take Leaders Credit Union with you wherever you go. From checking accounts, credit cards, home loans, and their state-of-the-art mobile app, Banking with Leaders can help you move forward. Learn more and see how you can qualify for membership at LeadersCU.com. I hope you're enjoying the Real Foot Forward podcast from Discovery Park of America. If you are, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a positive review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. So we've been talking a lot about the past. Uh, do, do you recall Robert Kirkland's last visit here, or did he give you any feedback through the years? Did he, how developed did he get to see this place become? It was uh, it was amazing in, in a short amount of time that uh, a lot of the plant material when I started, and I started in March of 2013, so obviously a lot of the, the majority of the plant material had already uh, been installed at that point. So we were just doing some final touches and putting things in, sprucing things up and throwing in a lot of flowering annuals and things like that. Um, but while he was here, I think he was thoroughly impressed with it um he, he always had a kind word he always had a suggestion well what if we did this or can we put this over here and well, sure we can do uh, we can do that and but i he i wish he could see it today and and i truly believe he probably is seeing it today 
but just to see some of the trees that have matured over the past 10 years, we've actually have a little bit of shade in places now. Yeah. So we're able to uh, branch out. <laughs> When you fr- ha, 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 thank when you. you first walk across the bridge, I mean it's even in the five years I've been here, it is markedly different. Things have grown significantly. Those trees in the parking lot, thank goodness, because that was a terribly hot, hot area. So the maple trees out there have just are those uh, maple quadrupled. trees? They My are, wife asked me that. What it, what were they? There's about three or four different varieties out there, and I couldn't name you which ones are exactly where. But red sunset. And I was hoping none October. of them were. Uh, is it pear trees that? Uh, yeah, yeah, we knew better than Bradford pears. Bradford the ones pears. That have we knew a short lifespan. Knew better than that because we don't uh, we don't like uh, the lifespan on those. So we're look, we've got a lot of oak trees that will be here for the next hundred years oh, or good. more, and uh, and we're on a, a fairly good tree succession program so that we're planning for the next hundred years. So we're planning things now that won't mature for the next twenty years, but. We know things come and go, and we've got storm damage that, uh, you know, the freeze of, was it last yeah, year or the year last before? Year that, that screwed up all the... Ooh, it messed up. Uh, it fir, killed... Fir trees, is that what they're called? They were, uh, they were several ones that really got a lot of our evergreens that got hit terribly hard, and yeah. uh, Yoshino cryptomerias were the ones that took the, uh, the worst hit, and we cut down 20 or 30 that... You know, it's tough to cut down a 15, 20-year-old tree. Mm. You just hate to see them go. But yeah, uh, we go back in and replace that with something. So every year we're planting 20 or 30 more trees, uh, shrubs we're replacing on annual basis and, and building up new areas and some areas that might not have uh, done too well. We go back in and, and pop new things in there. So And then we've got, um, I know you've been, since I've been here, I know you were asking for a greenhouse. Uh-huh. We finally got our <clears throat> greenhouse this past year. Um, That's uh, exciting. Yeah, yeah. What, what, what are the plans for the uh, greenhouse and the education pavilion? Yes, because we do have, uh, actually, we didn't just get one greenhouse, we got two. <clears throat> One is uh, considered more of a production house, and that's where most of our things go in that we're going to actually use on the grounds here. Then we have a state-of-the-art uh, education greenhouse that our education department has pretty much taken over, but they're doing so many things with hydroponics and soilless media and air layering and grafting and things. So it's it's truly hands-on. We can bring school groups in, and they can go in there and everything from planting seeds to seeing how... I mean, how do you grow a plant without any dirt? So it's it's, it's a fascinating process. Uh, as far as our production house, I'm uh, very excited about that because we were having to go out and purchase uh, all of our plant material. And sometimes that gets kind of limited on, on variety and selection on what I can do. So now uh, I can order seeds and put those out. This is our first year of growing, and I must say it, it went really well. We grew somewhere between eight to 10,000 uh, annual flowering plants in the greenhouse this year. Wow. And they all turned out, they look just as good as the ones that we So spend those a lot of money that I on. saw out there, they actually <clears throat> came from seeds? They all came from seeds. Huh. And uh, most of them, I think I didn't between that. eight to 10,000 plants out there, I could have fit all those seeds in, in the palm of my hand wow. just about. They're tiny little seeds. They look, <clears> it looked me. great. I mean, there were so many. I, I would have sworn you bought all those and put them in there. Uh, well, uh, that may be a thing that we may <laughs> have to start doing that. And and that they is so good. <clears throat> once we get our uh, program down and <clears throat> figure out uh, ins and outs of what we're going to be doing, I would, <clears throat> I'm hoping that we will have a uh, plant sale in the future yeah. so that we can take some things either grown from seed or we've got a lot of individ- or unique plants out here that we're going to start doing some cuttings and divisions and uh, I would like to s- see us have a, a members only sale or yeah. or something like that just to generate some interest bring people in see what we do every day well with the farm credit uh, mid america Pav- education pavilion right there next to it we've got the perfect setup to be able to do sales and education and <clears throat> and all kinds of things so um we right next to that is the vineyard how long uh, ago did we put in the grapevines and was that robert kirkland's suggestion i think that was something that he always always wanted and uh i think that went in in 2014 is when we first planted so a year after we opened and uh we we partnered with a local grower here uh with white white squirrel mm-hmm. uh winery and they he helped us come out and pick the varieties that we wanted um 
and we've got enough grapes out there. We have a white variety called Chardonnay and one called Chamberson that is a red grape. And it takes about three years from when you first set them out until you can first harvest. <clears throat> so that third year, we had a bumper crop, and uh, it's kind of a interesting and a fun thing to get members involved. I know my parents came out and helped us harvest grapes, uh, and they've been doing it every year for the past seven or eight years. And uh, it, it's fun to kind of – now, we don't strip off our socks and shoes and, and stomp like any of them. But, like uh, yeah. But well, we and send them off, and we actually make wine. We get a lot of other volunteers came. I know a lot of volunteers came and helped plant this year, folks from the Master Gardener Program of West Tennessee. Um, I know that was really uh, popular, a great opportunity for people to get their hands dirty if they don't have big yards anymore. And that's, and that was a great help, and it's a, it's a good – it's kind of fun. when <clears throat> If it was me out there trying to plant 8,000 flowers, that's work, and that's not much fun. But when you get a big group of people out there, it's, it's good camaraderie, and uh, it, it's fun for everybody. And, and then they feel a little investment with it, so – uh, they can bring their families back out and say, look, you know, I planted this, and it gives them a little bit of ownership also. So for folks listening who maybe aren't uh, up to speed on how to plant things, and um, what, are the, um, what are the things um, around here that grow really well? Like for me, with, an, with my house, and I'm new, you know, well, it's been five years, but, right. you know, Northwest Tennessee has a specific um, – uh, environment and whatever you call it that you put it in the dirt and it grows right. so what what are some of the easy things that will most likely grow? oh that's a tough one because uh, there's such a such a long list of things that we do I'm going to say some of our favorite ones out here I love just about any kind of perennial uh, which means that we plant them once and, and they're going to come back the next year and I'm not talking about trees or shrubs but um, you yeah, like is it lilac <clears throat> that I've or the seen butterfly growing. bush probably yeah. is, is a good one and it, it does die back uh, you know and, and we usually cut most of our butterfly bushes back to the ground and let them flush back out the well, next year okay but. well see i wondered about that because i have three or four butterfly bushes at my house that i planted because i saw them here and they've been just sticks and all of a sudden things are growing up from the ground but the right. sticks are so i should have cut them I should and have cut the that doesn't part. really hurt anything just makes them look a little bit neater but okay. uh, yeah they usually will <clears throat> a lot of them will come back from the base some of them will you know are, are hardier than others and will come back gotcha um but all the uh veronica is one of my favorite that's one of the plants that's growing in the arrival circle when you come up that has mm. just been fantastic and it's about ready to start blooming beautiful purple uh blooms on it and i'm hoping we're going to divide those at the end of this year and start spreading those out across the park but what are the yellow ones that, that... we've got a lot of daylilies uh there were yeah, those over are beautiful I, I, if I remember correctly, looking back at the original plans, there were something like eight to 10,000 daylilies that were planted out here. Uh, I love ornamental grasses. They're one of my favorite. They don't necessarily flower, but they do produce those big plumes uh, during the fall that kind of hold through the winter and look good. But they're they're tough as nails and, and uh, never have to worry about those. Once every three years, you go in and divide those and make some new ones, and uh, they just keep on giving. Which really, it's it's nice how you've kind of got it separated out by area, so that you get a different sort of vibe, depending on what part of the park you're in. The Japanese gardens, one; the European right. gardens, the other. Um, and that was a good the architect that, that they hired. Uh, I think he sat down with Mr. Kirkland for a, a good while and said, uh, "I know he, Mr. Kirkland himself, was very interested in Japanese gardens. He just loved the idea of it and the tranquility and the." reflection uh you know it's a good meditation space so uh he had some very specific ideas on our japanese garden here some of it has worked we're still tweaking that a little bit and uh you know with any garden there's going to be some problems is it if it wasn't it'd be easy and everybody would do it but um but we're we do have some very unique gardens the european garden is kind of fun because it's a lot more formal and laid out uh in very geometric patterns we have uh, an American garden, which is a little looser with different types of textures and, and sizes and shapes of plants. So there's a little bit of everything. You'll you come out and take a look uh, from turf grass to uh, big giant trees out there. We've got a little bit of everything. Well, and then I know when we kicked off the uh, new ag exhibit that we also started pollinators we have a oh. working beehive a pollinator garden and what have you I, last year 
I cut some of the uh, zinnias, yes. the zinnia heads, and I took them home and planted them, and they're coming up at my house. Uh, what, did you uh, plant zinnias again this year out there in the pollinator gardens, we've or got, what's out there? We've got a little bit of, of, of everything out towards the back of the property. I'm, I'll start out with we do grow some crops out there because a lot of people haven't seen or know uh, what crops – look like it'd be amazing how many people have never actually gone up and picked some cotton before so we have cotton corn and soybeans in some of our our little test plots out there so school groups come in and they can kind of see wow this is where my clothing comes from uh, we also have a lot of wildflowers um, that we do from seed uh, every year so we have a wildflower meadow that has like 38 different varieties that are native to the southeast uh, our big one of our big plots that is almost a third of an acre I have planted uh, uh, zinnias and cosmos out there that really ought to put on a show in about another three or four weeks. And as a backdrop on that, I've got some giant mammoth sunflowers that are going to be 12 feet tall. And oh, wow. that makes a really cool backdrop. So, And then, you know, I-69 <clears throat> has opened now so people can drive by and see us. I know that for many years before I-69 was open, we've been working with the state of Tennessee to grow some uh at, I don't know what you call them, but at the time, we just stuck some little tiny sticks in the ground, and I thought, there's no way that's going to be anything. And now, I mean, they're as tall as I am. They have really matured and come in, and it's it's a good teaching moment because these are not really highly ornamental things. There's some wild pears back there. There's a few other varieties of things, but they're great habitat for birds. They're pollinators. Uh, they are monarch butterfly host plants out there with the milkweed and things like that so uh, it's a good teaching moment to show that everything doesn't have to be neatly trimmed and uh, especially if you're looking to promote wildlife then you want it to be a little bit wilder and and a little looser and it also makes a great break i was amazed the first time i saw some cars going up and down the uh, the new interstate behind us that good grief that's loud <laughs> right yeah. we haven't been used to that for 13 years so yeah. that c- creates a, a fantastic buffer for the noise and we're going to plant a few more things back there um nothing to block the property we're not trying to hide ourselves we're trying to promote ourselves but things that will uh enhance that a little bit and also help out with some of the noise well and i know that we just you know there are some areas where we are purposefully leaving unsprayed natural and we put up some signs that said uh, uh forgive our pardon, weeds pardon we're, our weeds pardon we're our feeding our the weeds. bees yeah we're feeding the bees <laughs> so you know i know it's part of what we're here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond and so that applies towards not every not every space has to be completely manicured and mowed and free of weeds we want to feed the birds and the bees yes. and the other pollinators so and, and it's it's a amazing the difference you can look from one side of the road to the other and see what it looks like if you're on a uh, manicured turf program where we are trying to keep the weeds and keep our Bermuda just as clean and uh, weed free as we can and then you look across the road and there's a tons of white clover growing out there the bees absolutely love the white clover Mm -hmm. and uh, it makes really good honey so even at my house I have been um, leaving a big section unmowed just to see what would happen and not sprayed, you know, All and right. same thing. And the clover and the bees are everywhere. So that's a, it's a, you know, it's a growing trend and it, it's something that, you know, sustainability is a, is a big buzzword has been for the past five or 10 years. Uh, how do we maintain our landscape? Are we using up all of our resources? Are we, are we using too many fertilizers and pesticides? And what if we go back to maybe I don't have to have a perfectly manicured lawn as uh, it's, you know, different strokes for different folks, and and uh, but it is a great teaching moment to go out and look at some of those areas and say, well, this is why this doesn't look quite as good as as the other side is because uh, look at the habitat and what all we're doing for the wildlife out there. So one of my biggest problems <clears throat> is when I let things grow natural. There's a, something called is it stilt weed or still still weed? It's something that in the 50s they used in Japan as packing materials, ah. and the seeds got here. And there's a bunch of that in my yard, and where I'm growing things naturally. Yeah, that's a tough one. It's you know if you're going to leave something unsprayed or trying to get it back natural, uh, you, we do have a lot of invasive species and and. Uh, 
you know, kudzu was always the one that, you know, was introduced and everybody thought it was going to take over the world. It's it's not as bad as everybody makes it out to be. But there are some other, uh, you know, thistles and things like that that are truly, they're not native, they're invasive species that at one point, at one point uh, for all the farmers and everybody else out there, Johnson grass mm. uh, was actually introduced as a forage grass. Mm. And uh, uh, they thought, oh, this is going to be a great crop because it just keeps coming back and it's hard to kill. And uh, they were right there. It is extremely hard to mm. kill. So it's a, con- still considered an invasive species. Yeah. Well, I'm trying to decide at my own house, how much do I spray and do I spray? And, you know, I bought this thing, this tool you're supposed to be able to use to pull the weeds mm, out of yeah. the ground. Yeah, by yeah, weed hand. popper. Right. Yeah. So I've been trying to do that. But I'm telling you, there's it a, is hard to keep up with. There's a, a fine line there. And it's it's... The, the thing that's been around forever is called IPM, Integrated Pest Management. So you need to find an acceptable level of just how many weeds can I uh, live with, or in my case, how many weeds can my wife live with, right. uh, and, and go from there. And you don't have to kill every single weed. There is a threshold there that, you know, this doesn't look too bad, and, and I'm getting some extra benefit out of it, so I don't have to kill every single weed. Yeah, I used to be passionate about not having any weeds and my <laughs> girls would come home with those uh dandelions that would be fluffy <laughs> yes, white yes. you blow on them and make a wish i would be no because oh, i don't want those seeds you know right. flying all over so but the dandelions are really pretty when they're yellow and they the, are the bees can you know lo- seem to love those as well now we have something new we haven't even announced yet <clears throat> that's coming up uh you applied for us to be um yes. Go ahead and tell it's us. It's an all of uh, it's called All America Selections. Uh, it is a a testing group and uh, that evaluates new plants on the market, or, or basically new seeds uh, that that are coming on the market. So they will do several years of trials, um, and then they will release them to the public. So we have applied for and been granted permission to be an All America Display Garden. All America Selections Display Garden, which we will get seeds that aren't available to the public, but we will grow those in a greenhouse, and we're gonna we're in the process of building a, a garden dedicated to that. So we'll have raised beds, lots of good signage, but you'll be able to come out and see some of these brand new varieties that nobody else has, and uh, and and be able to purchase them either the next year or the following year. So I'm I'm excited about that. That's they always have some extremely cool plants and not only flowers but they've got vegetables and other things too yeah i'm looking forward to that as well just as somebody who likes to plant things i'm looking forward to seeing what they send and and <clears throat> what what it ends up looking like um i'm assuming there's also like um uh all different kinds of flowers that are like bulbs too is it bulbs or is it just mainly seeds mainly just seeds because this seeds? this uh this particular group they deal more with plants that are, are grown from seeds mm, so it's okay uh there's some other ones other groups out there that do more plant materials everybody's seen proven winners or you go to the nursery now and they'll have big tags that promote that these are proven winners that uh they've tested and and uh made sure they're good for our area and very specific um different kinds of plants in that well i like um iris irises yeah so that's um, our state flower, right that's our, so. you know i i've always liked irises and iris bulbs and i've planted a bunch but i've only had a couple come up this year i think they skip a year i can't remember well there, i think there are some varieties that do and we that's one thing that has been on my list that we have got to do i'm embarrassed to say we don't have we've got some very specific types of iris but i would love to have uh, I mean, there's so many great colors and I mean go to Dresden during their iris festival right. and and get an idea on what you can do and I all the different do they varieties. sell iris there I'm sure they do somewhere I gotta there, go but. um check that out I, the, all the iris I have now at my house came from my mother's house and she got them from my grandmother's house so they're they're you know, they, heirloom they're heirloom, hand me down plants I've, yes. I've done the same I've got a uh, a, an old peony that actually is my great great grandmother's that wow. came from uh, somewhere out in Reeves, Tennessee, and then my grandmother got it, and I took some. I actually, I'm been spreading it everywhere. I had some in when I was in Virginia, and I took some d- divisions and took them to Georgia and had them grow in there. I, I wouldn't be surprised. We may have one here on the property that I snuck in from mm. from there, but oh, I've got them cool. got them at my house, and they're just a good old fashioned heirloom plant that still is fantastic and beautiful. So yeah, I I have some canna. 
that's like that that I right. and canna does really well in this area. It does. There's some that are more hardy than others, but if you've got a good protected area, they'll come back year after year and and really do well. And they've got some crazy colors out there, not just the flowers, but things that look like tiger stripes on the leaves and different colored foliage so they look good even when they're not flowering they still look good i've been seeing that and then um um hosta is is another one yes that's, that's one area we have uh, hosta are one of my favorite plants and I, I never was able to grow those when i was at the college down in georgia because we had herds of deer mm. that would come in and and eat all of our hostas and even at my uh my house in downtown paris those dang deer come up on my porch and will eat them eat my hostas out of the pots there huh. so luckily we're fenced in here and i have not seen it well i'm gonna knock on wood i haven't seen any deer here yet yeah uh but now that we're starting to develop them we've got some mature trees and we've got a few other shady areas i'm hoping to incorporate a a really good hosta dedicated hosta garden and have them labeled and because um, there are so many varieties of that we could have thousands of them and yeah, never no, seen the same cool. one that would be cool to have a hosta. We didn't we talk about that? We Over did near the chapel. We did, and um, that area is uh, is prime for uh, for doing that now because we finally we've got the trees up, and that's really our sh- one of our shadiest areas on the property right now. Yeah, no, it, it's really beautiful over there. So, last question: uh, You are young enough where you'll be here at least another twenty years. Uh, <laughs> what, what is your maybe vision? in spirit? <laughs> <laughs> what is your vision for the future of Discovery Parks grounds? Oh me, I mean, it's it's exciting to come in and still again see all this, uh, see all these plantings mature. And see some new areas being developed. Uh, that that's always exciting. And doing a lot more with education, um, you know. Do I think we could do a lot better with with some of our labeling? Uh, I need to replace a lot of those. We've uh, we've added some new things and need to update that a little bit better. Uh, we're not truly a a botanical garden, but we are a fantastic display garden that uh, you can always come out and see something new uh, that. We get so many questions about what's this flower or what's this shrub. I've never seen this before. Uh, the hypericums or the uh, the vines. I was stopping with talking with somebody yesterday in front of the ag center that are growing up the outside. They said I've never ever seen this before. I think they were from Oklahoma, mm. and I, I told them this is our actually our state wildflower. It's a passion vine that the flowers are just the most fascinating, beautiful flower I've ever seen. Um, so it, it's it, it's things like that just to watch new groups come in and always see something new and we try and change things out enough we'll we'll do different plantings throughout the year and and hopefully every time you come back you'll see something that you didn't see before well and that's what's so interesting about planting things and growing things is that it looks completely different from one day to the next Mm. you know you can come back and see and you'll have a surprise something that you didn't necessarily plant but maybe a bird dropped a seed oh yes boom there's something cool we've got plants showing up that i keep wondering where they came from so uh they they are self-populating and then you you gave me a couple of moon vine and i put them in Uh, a pot and put them a thing that and i mean they're going they're growing I swear you can almost see them growing <laughs> while you're watching. The, I love the moon vines because the, the flowers on there uh, only open up at, at nighttime. So late afternoon, uh, I, I actually took one home with me, and I, I grabbed it out of the greenhouse, and I put it in my trunk. Mm-hmm. And by the time I got home, that flower had opened completely up because it was dark back there, and it, yeah. it, that triggers it just that quick. So you can truly almost sit there and watch them open. Which yeah, is no, fun. I mean it's crazy how pretty they are against the the dark sky. You know, they're growing so fast. So anyway, well, thank you so much for all the work you do here at Discovery well, Park, and thank a, you for joining us today to talk about it. It's a my pleasure, and and again, come out and see something new. If you see anybody that's out there on the on the grounds crew or walking around ask questions we love to if there's any gardeners out there you know how much we all love to talk and uh, share insights or new ideas or favorite plants or whatever so make sure you engage with us thanks to all you listeners who have joined zach john watkins and myself today at discovery park of america our mission here is to inspire children and adults to see beyond to plan an experience here for you and your family to check out the 50-acre heritage park and and all the landscaping John and I have been talking about, visit discoverypark of America.com. <laughs>